your competitors are going to be putting themselves out there. Mm-hmm. And if you're not putting yourself out there, you're probably you know, immediately watching the projects dry up. Episode 118. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And once again, I find myself in the beautiful old offices located in the heart of Blackfriars with my good friends Rob Fien and Luke Neeb, who of course are regulars on the show on Business of Architecture and are fabulous architectural PR maestros. And for those of you who don't know who Rob is, Robert Fien is the founder of Robert Fien Architectural Communications. He has over 10 years of experience working closely with architects, helping them communicate effectively to the press and to their other stakeholders. And Luke is the founder of Neve, which is a specialist communications consultancy for architects, design and the culture industries. And he has a vast array of experience working with both creative and corporate clients. And in this conversation, we discuss the impending recession that we have already entered into and what architects need to be doing to prepare and get ready for the recession and how they should be managing and strategizing their communications. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Luke Neve and Robert Fien. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of I'd also love to hear more about your business what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Rob, Luke, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you guys? Yeah, very good, thank you. Good, thank you. Excellent. We're into our second round of lockdown and the industry is kind of you know where it's been a very interesting year this year particularly comms wise and how businesses have been preparing themselves and pivoting and adapting business models to be able to deal with all of the complexity that's been going on and we were chatting a few weeks ago about the importance of being ready and prepared for what might happen in the economy so obviously we don't quite know where the the future is going to lie, but it's pretty looking pretty certain that there's, there's going to be a deeper recession than what we're already in now. So the conversation today was going to be about how can architects get ready, can get recession ready, and particularly what they should be doing with their, with their comms. So over to you, Rob. What's the, what's the, what, what, what would you suggest is the sort of first things that we should be looking at? Well, it's, it's interesting you said about being adaptive, because I think... We've all gone through a phase of adaptation from lockdown one. Mm. And as we've told you before, one of the first things we did was set up this um, comms crits, Zoom conversation, series of conversations that we started having with different practices. And that's been going really well, actually. And essentially, I guess what we're doing is helping people to get their comms uh, house in order. So it's, it's kind of, I guess, what we first want to ask questions like, what are you doing? What have you done in the past? What's worked well? What's more you maybe not had time to do? You know, um, and I guess what's the, what are the targets or the aims? So what, what can comms do to help you? And just giving them some time to sort of bounce ideas off us. And then we sort of, we write up these recommendations, but you could totally do it yourself. Mm-hmm. So I think it's about having a sort of little audit 
Um, because in reality, no one is ever doing perfect cons. And the vast majority of architects are probably quite in quite a bad place with their cons. And uh, as Amanda Bailey, who, who runs Arkaboo, tweeted about recently, recessions are absolutely the worst time to have bad marketing. Well, this 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 out of date idea that um, my work will speak for itself is I mean it's bad anyway, but in a recession it's doubly bad, mm-hmm. and you could be in a you your business could be in a lot of trouble because it's going to get more competitive. Other people are going your competitors are going to be putting themselves out there, mm-hmm. and if you're not putting yourself out there, you're probably you're going to immediately watching the projects dry up. So I think absolutely now's the time to do it, but maybe spend some time getting comms ready, looking at um, social media, newsletters, website, all of that stuff, and just sort of get it get it in order. Yeah, and I think like the pandemic, a recession can also be that period of time of like reflection on the goals and direction of the practice, which will help to inform your comms, basically. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I mean... I mean, Luke, we've been talking particularly, haven't we, to people about sectors Mm -hmm. that they're looking to sort of, you said pivot to, yeah, to sort of, you know, maybe focus on in terms of profitability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, for example, if you're working in um, a couple of sectors like commercial fit out and residential, then um, it might be make sense to step away a little bit from the commercial sector and focus on residential. I'm sure that there'll be quite a lot of people um, coming out of the pandemic that will be looking to improve their homes. So you could really capitalise on that moment. How, how does a practice begin to make that kind of assessment over what sector is going to be profitable and what sectors are not? Um, well, I think that... Uh, you know, that is an element of looking at what's profitable, but it's also looking at what you have the most experience in right? and where you could um, provide the most value for your clients. Um, so, you know, if, if for example, you've got a lot of experience in doing uh, commercial fit-out and residential, um, it's not to say that you could apply some of those commercial elements to like a creating a workspace in a home or, or something like that. So it's thinking about where you can change and adapt those mm. to, to fit a new kind of uh, opportunities. Yeah, and I think read the news, mm. right? So if you see, if you're, if you're shutting yourself off, then you're not aware of what's going on in the market. So if there's headlines saying, um, you know, landlords are slashing, um, you know, leases... You know, and they're they're, stop, they're they're stopping work on on building office buildings. You need to respond to that, mm. and so so that, that in that way again, the press is is useful in serving you because they're pointing out where there might be opportunities. I mean, with art galleries and theatres shut, I wouldn't say that now is the time to fulfil that dream of cultural projects. <laughs> yeah, because no one's going to be commissioning them. Yeah, so I think you just you need to be realistic and. I'm not saying give up on your dreams, but just, you know, um, just just refocus them to weather the storm. I think a lot of people are learning the lessons from the 2008 crash, which was a real, was a real shock to the system. Mm. But I think people have, have, have realised that we just can't behave like that anymore. Otherwise, you're just going to go into free fall. Yeah. I mean, the other good news is that recessions are traditionally... A, a really exciting time for the the birth of new practices. Mm-hmm. So people sometimes, without outside of their choice, they're pushed out of a larger practice, mm-hmm. and they have to set up on their own, and they have to they have to figure out ways of making money in very difficult economic circumstances, which actually kind of makes your practice leaner and more efficient. Yeah. So we'll see what happens, but I think. If you're a small small practice that's been running going for a while, you should probably watch out because there's going to be you're going to have more competition than before. Yeah, it's interesting you say that. I mean, so many of the people that I've interviewed in the past, um, either they went through a sort of sharp contraction in the last recession and had to adapt their business model, or made unemployed and decided to set up a business, and it kind of 
it changed things. And actually, <clears throat> if that is happening to you, it is, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to restructure um, and to, yeah, exactly, kind of create something new. What are some of the, the, the don'ts? We, we, you mentioned earlier about how Amanda was saying, you know, now's not the time to be kind of falling back on your marketing and your business development. And often in times of recession, marketing budgets are the first things to get cut and slashed. What, what are some of the, the, the absolute do not do's for practice right now? Well, I think like, <clears throat> I mean, like Rob outlined earlier, that moment of stopping, you know, everyone takes a deep breath in and they're like, oh, what should we do? How do we talk about our work to other people? And that can often cause a moment of just complete discommunication. You stop mm. uh, broadcasting um, and in that way you kind of fade away. And ultimately, that will hurt your work later down the line. So I've seen quite a lot of practices over the past few months really embrace things like social media. Um, there have been some practices that have kind of stepped back from that. And I think it's really important to you know, keep your voice out there and keep yourself in the front of people's minds. And I think people are very sad they've lost a lot of networking opportunities mm -hmm. there's no physical events and so what they've done is they've just gone through their list and struck off networking mm. and said um well i don't do that anymore because i can't but uh, again that's absolutely the wrong thing to do so you need to put any uh timid side of your personality away put that in a little drawer and start reaching out to people <laughs> <laughs> directly because um, if there was ever a time when people would understand why you're sending an email or picking up the phone to contact them, it's now. So they're all going through similar things in their own businesses. So there's there's no shame or embarrassment at, at saying, um, I'm you know I'm an architect. This is this is what I do. This is how I think it might work for you. Be interested to talk more about it. Um, all that shows is that you are uh, another business person trying to make your business a success and make a connection. Um, and I think some of those, you said before, Luke, some of those connections can happen on social media as well. Yes, yeah, definitely. Particularly LinkedIn. I mean, it's like a virtual networking event, isn't it? So there are, you know, people are spending much more time there and generating content specifically for LinkedIn, which I think was previously more of a, or we've posted on Instagram now, we better get this up on LinkedIn and yeah. repost exactly the same content. I think you're seeing people thinking a bit more carefully about how they represent themselves and their business on yeah. platforms like LinkedIn. I think I, I um, helped organise an event with Build Up and the Architecture Marketing Forum last week where we had a social media expert come and outside of the built environment industry come and speak to us about social media and he was talking in particular about LinkedIn and how it's very like a uh, person to person platform instead of like a uh, overall like broadcasting yeah. um, thing. So like, if you think from a very like personal point of view, that's a brilliant place to um, meet and talk to people and share what work you're doing. So, so using it less as a place just to post content as such, but as a place to actually make personal one to one yeah, connections that's right. and yeah. start conversations as if you were in a in a in a room with you know cheap alcohol and exactly. cocktail sticks and cheese yeah, exactly and I think as well um, you know places like LinkedIn break down traditional barriers of like uh, location you can speak to people you know, wherever they are based mm. in the world and also in different time zones because you can just message them and then they'll pick up on it later so what what, what sorts of because this, this is something people often ask me is like if you're going to using a platform like so like like, like linkedin mm -hmm. what sorts of how do you open a conversation like how do you like somebody you've never met before what sorts of things would you would you say or would you send or would be useful content to kind of make a meaningful connection um i think you just have to be genuine and honest mm. um the way that i've been using linkedin i guess is slightly different because i'm a comms professional is just to message people and say oh i quite like I've, i like what you've been posting about recently 
found that really interesting, like, um, or you ask them a question, that can often be a good way to prompt a conversation. Um, I think I think also, I've never seen certainly in architecture. I've never until recently saw so seen so much content produced explicitly for LinkedIn. Mm. So normally, what would happen is you would be part of some other kind of event or some other uh, comment piece in the press, and then you would post that on LinkedIn. And in a way, it's quite passive. It's quite advertorial. You're just saying like, here is a thing that you should look you should look at. Mm. Whereas now people are writing essays, aren't they, and, and yeah. what to do uh, as articles on LinkedIn and then saying, look at this thing that I've written that has a relevance to your business as well as mine. And what you're seeing in the comments below is people saying, oh, I really enjoyed reading this. We, we should go for a virtual coffee. You know, like, so I think you, you can kind of almost, you can also draw them in yeah. by providing, I guess, con- ideas and content for free. Yeah. But you will... But people need to contact you because you have the expertise to make it a reality. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So, so I suppose this, LinkedIn can become a platform where you can you can almost probably repurpose a lot of other kind of marketing collateral that you might already have and redeploy it onto the onto the platform with a with a kind of nuanced tonality yeah. for your for your target exactly. market. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now I've known practices who have done presentations. Right. But they go around to different studios. And they say, these are 10 ways to make um, schools more sustainable. And they just turn that into a LinkedIn post. It's the same presentation. They're not having to, not having to sit down and fret over, well, what content can I produce? It's just stuff. They've just maybe tidied up the language a bit um, and just popped it on. It, take, you know, it really doesn't take that much time out of your day. You could do it on a lunch break. Yeah. But, then you, you know, but if you're someone who works in that school environment, then your LinkedIn is likely to have lots of those contacts primed and ready to go and now more people are looking at it Mm. yeah i think also a great way to you know start relationships with people is to go in to thinking about um starting conversations where it's more of a like you're looking for advice rather than you're looking to secure a new job so i will quite often contact you know I've been trying to speak to more architects based in China and Japan, just out of curiosity of how they work their communications there. And so it's been more of a conversation of like, I'd love to just have a conversation with you about what it's like there work-wise at the moment. And you can just have genuine like swapping of knowledge, basically. Yeah. Instead of when are you going to give me the next job? Yeah, becomes more of a like honest, open conversation where you're sharing information. It, it it sounds so obvious, but it's actually you know it's kind of like what would you do if you were speaking to somebody right yeah. next to you? You wouldn't go straight into a sales pitch mm-hmm. and say, "Here's what I do." You 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 know you just you start a relationship by asking questions and getting interested in the other yeah. person. Yeah, and, exactly. And, and all of this is kind of relationship cultivation, if you like. And I think one th- last thing I'd say on LinkedIn is that. I have noticed that some of the people I work with are on there, but their profiles are a mess. So mm-hmm. just tidy them up, please. You know, it does, you don't have to fill out every, don't be daunted by filling out every box, but just make sure, you know, that um, the basic material is there. What, what's, what's a messy profile and what's a... Well, what's, usually what's an empty the... one. An, em- an empty <laughs> one is bad, so no photo. <laughs> Ridiculous, because if someone's met you at an event, but they can't remember if it was you who said that interesting thing, you know, just, you need a photo up there, hopefully reasonably up to date. Um, and then just the basics of your company website, you know, um, uh, you know, maybe places you've worked before, but more kind of the sectors that you're working in now. And then also I think um, if you have a company page, the company page can do a lot of posting, mm-hmm. which, cause that looks, nice and neat right. but then you need to repost it from your personal yeah. account because it's your black book so your your company account might have a hundred followers say but without even trying your black book might be over 500 and there a lot of them are really relevant so you can't expect all of those people to see your company post yeah unless you repost it yeah great yeah and what about reposting other people's content or sharing other people's content I mean, I've, I've found in, in the past, sometimes you, 
you know, for if you're an architect and you say repost something of an estate agent's, like you're you're trying to help somebody else's business and you make an intelligent comment about, you know, saw this lovely property on sale with these with these guys. Often you're often that person whose content it is will kind of reach out to you personally and say, thanks, thanks for doing that. Mm-hmm. It kind of becomes quite a nice way of, again, inviting conversations to people. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good approach. Yeah, definitely. Brilliant. So what's so what else? What's what, what other things do we need to be thinking about in terms of recession, getting recession ready? Well, I think I <clears throat> think there's been a glut of ideas competitions coming out at the moment. We've seen uh, Reba doing stuff on housing. There's recently been the Davidson Prize, which is about working redesigning homes for working from home. There's, all the, there's, there's a lot of things out there which it might have quite long odds to apply for, but you shouldn't see competitions as a purely win or lose situation. They are R&D opportunities. They're a reason to get the whole team together virtually or physically mm-hmm. um, to brainstorm an idea that might be very relevant to your business, or you might even have come up with a solution before, but you need to tweak it and make it a bit more conceptual, a bit more broader thinking, a bit more exciting. Um, And then the competition gives you a reason and a deadline to do it. And then if you don't even get shortlisted, hey presto, you've got a load of content Mm. that can go on social media channels as multiple posts. Um, It can go on a newsletter saying, we've finished this project, but we've also had this, uh, we also took part in this competition recently with this amazing idea. Um, it could be the premise for a comment piece that you pitch to a magazine. So I just think that I think the ideas competitions are really good. I'm not sure. I'm not saying all competitions are right. So the next Guggenheim uh, or Icelandic K <laughs> competition <laughs> that comes up it is not maybe not necessarily appropriate for your market. Yeah. But I think if it's something that you do, or it's something as Luke says that there's a sector of your business that can be turned to something a new advantage then I, I think it's worth dedicating some resource and budget to it. Because during a recession, as we've sort of said, people are looking for new and fresh approaches. They, it, might, it might actually be a time where they're thinking, we, we've been working with that practice for years, maybe it's time we shook things up a bit. Mm. We need to rethink how, how these projects look, how they're built. Um, and they don't tend to, people, clients don't tend to look that far. It's the thing that drops into their inbox that day. So often it's a bit about luck and good timing. But if you're not doing any of that, yeah, then people don't know that you're up for the challenge. Mm. Right. Yeah, I think like along with luck and good timing, it's also that presence, that continuous presence that you can have on your platforms and through like any events and things that you're running so that you're, you're at the front of their mind when they're thinking about something. And goes back to also thinking about the specialism if you're known for a certain area or for doing something very particular in that kind of typology, then people will come to you when the opportunity arises. Got it. And it- I'm sure people have seen this already, but you know, I've I've you know, I've definitely seen people who, who are known for workspace mm. posting about residential things and saying, um, this is what we learned from offices which is clearly a trend or going on in residential design. And we're, you know, we're, we're going to be better at doing that than a residential architect who's only ever done their approach for homes. So I think, yeah, crossing those boundaries. Yeah. Got it. And actually kind of going into a sort of micro niche, if you like, or yeah, yeah. kind of, yeah, communicating your specialism and how it's appropriate into, you know, the home exactly. office world that everybody's kind of looking into at the moment. Fantastic. Um, so at, at the moment, what is it like in terms of being able to get published and getting access into magazines and publications? Mm-hmm. Um, it's much more difficult than it was pre-pandemic. Mm. And that's for a multiple, there's multiple reasons behind that. Um, I mean, it's, it ranges from publications having to um, unfortunately close their doors um, or roles being combined into multiple roles being combined into one role that somebody has to kind of take up the mantle on. 
So you're finding a lot more journalists and editors are uh, under much more time pressure um, to kind of, you know, take in work and consider whether it's the right thing for their publication. And as a result of that, your standard kind of um, <clears throat> press release or, um, you know, pitch to, to an editor will not have the same impact as it did previously. So you need to think slightly beyond that. What can you do that will help you stand out from that sort of pitch? Mm. Is it, um, you know, you create a, a tiny piece of video content that they could put straight up on their site? Do you provide them with gifts? Like, do you, you just need to think slightly beyond that sort of standard text document and image pack if you want something that's slightly more bespoke and like more feature led. Got um, it. So it's almost like you're helping craft a story for the journalist right. and taking the, the 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 a lot of the work out for them so that's they can right. they can choose an angle as well. Yeah. 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 We've seen, obviously, we've seen video content is very gratefully received, but it can't be um, it can't be just an advert for your practice because no one's going to post that. So it can't be like. We're great because of this. Come look at our work. Yeah, uh, it doesn't work. But if you just have a simple video, it can just be kind of almost, almost like an extension of photography, can't it? Mm -hmm. Where you're just sort of like, you know, short little um, uh, filmed moments of a project that sort of become a sort of collage. Just that it just adds another layer where publications go. I can do something with this, mm. um, and I think it just as as Luke says, just elevates you above and beyond. Mm. I think also in your pitches, if there are any similar projects by other high quality architects, you can reference them to a journalist and say, well, actually, you know, this, um, this uh, pink extension that we've done, not necessarily ever came pink extension, but, <laughs> you know, we've seen, we've seen this coming up again and again. Um, it's obviously people are, people are embracing bright colors more. Mm. Perhaps that's, Perhaps that's a trend. Um, you know, you don't tell the journalist their job, but if you give them, you know, s sort of say that there's this is definitely a thing, you, you're, that's something for them to work with. Mm -hmm. You're obviously pitching your project, and the email and the press release and the images are just your project, but referencing other work, I think, is a really helpful thing to do. So it's like a, a mini kind of curation job that you've that you've done and presented rather than just a kind of a feature led a feature led piece on a single project or, or yeah practice. And I think it I think it also makes you look better yeah right because you're saying design doesn't happen in isolation and so you're sort of saying hey we're doing this and other people are doing it too it's obviously it goes to show that my design is is part of something mm. and I think sometimes architects get a little bit bogged down in this idea of originality and independence and saying, well, only I do this, so you've got to hire me. But that's not really how it works. And it's better just to sort of accept that your peers um, uh, are not just competitors, they're also, you know, uh, proof of why design is going in a certain direction. Do, you, do, do architects do this a lot, do you think, kind of group together and collectively campaign and say here's what we're good as as a group like lots of i see lots of other industries people partners doing this where they're where they're saying that here's a here's a broad set of skills and solutions that we're serving our clients with or are our architects kind of more singular in their approach well there are a few collectives um and groups that have formed over the past few months and the past few years i think like um, the London Practice Forum, for example, which is a collection of similar sized architecture practices that kind of work together to form an ethical framework of, um, you know, delivering projects. And that, that was kind of formed partially to um, kind of help each other in how to run um, architecture practice. Mm -hmm. But then also they've um, had a bit of influence on um, competitions, for example. So I think the Southwark framework was one example of that where they had um, all came together as a group to question them on their BIM capability, which was a, 
um, important element of the thing. If you didn't have a certain BIM capability, then you wouldn't be allowed to be on the framework. And they kind of came together to force them to think about changing that so that smaller practices who didn't have the BIM capabilities of larger practices could get access to that framework. So there's definitely some worth in kind of coming together and, right. you know, thinking about that. I think there are, we spoke to the Dolson Architecture Collective as part of our comms crit service. And in a similar way, they were kind of quite at quite the early stages of thinking about how they could talk to councils and generate work to, as a collective of small architecture practices. It's almost like a kind of pre-made framework. Exactly, of, of, yeah. Of exactly. Architects. So, yeah, there's definitely worth in doing that and finding it. If you can't find one for your particular niche, then why not start it? And, yeah. you know, there, there's something to be said as being a, a head of a group like that. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right. I think it happens more in other creative circles. Mm. Uh, and I think, as usual, architecture is playing catch up. But there's there's a, a much more willingness to do it now. And actually what we're seeing is that that is happening... Um, that is happening from younger practices who are just, mm. you know, being created into this ethos of um, collaboration. Mm. But actually, you're starting to see the older, more established practices are actually looking downwards and thinking, how can we work with smaller practices as well? So when you're thinking about your comms, there's this sometimes this false idea that you shouldn't be speaking to other architects. You know, you see, you see quite, you see quite a lot of statements from uh, certainly from marketing people saying, "What architects? Why are you targeting other architects? You know, that's that's pointless for your business." Actually, that's nonsense because other architects are potential employees. Obviously, um, they're also uh, potential collaborators, and often, you know, you'll see the tiniest of like two-person practices are brought in to make up a team you know, for a big mixed use development. So, but that they're not going to reach out to you if they've never heard of you. Yeah. So I think you should be thinking about architects as part of your comms plan. That's really interesting. And also it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a way for smaller practices, perhaps who haven't got particular expertise or experience in other sectors. You can leverage the experience of other practices. So kind of having a marketing channel, which is directed towards collaboration actually be very a, a, another another part of your arsenal if you like i mean again and it goes back to reaching out to people so i think you i think you can definitely approach other practices that's probably the easiest thing you can do and say well how do you work what are you doing and you can do you can do swaps you know i mean maybe when we're back more back in the office but you can say come in and do a practice presentation at us we'll come back and do a practice presentation there you know, I've seen the very small, completely unheard of practices. Apparently, have done presentations at Karakusevich Carson mm. Architects because they might have more local knowledge about a particular area. Or they might have, you know, they might have done worked in a specific form of hybrid construction, for instance. I'm actually thinking of a real example, and where these practices were brought in, and you know, loads of people in Karakusevich Carson got around the table and were like, "Wow, this is, you know, this is a really interesting approach." Maybe that would affect our work. Maybe it would affect our work in the long run. Mm. So I think, I think yes, during a recession, seeing other architects as allies uh, rather than purely as competitors, obviously you are pitching for work, but it could be a way to save your business. Yeah. And I think larger practices do need the smaller practices sometimes for more community engagement or more just, yeah, on the ground knowledge. Yeah, I think as well, looking outside of the architecture sphere your um subcontractors and other um people that you work with on projects like engineers for example it's good to make sure that your network there is quite strong and i do know some practices that have got work from you know from recommendations mm-hmm. from engineers before in the past so thinking about that too maybe you've maybe you spent some time thinking and researching an engineering practice that would fit your practice perfectly. So you're looking for those like good matches ready for a tender if it came for a competition bid. Um, that, that can work really well as well. Yeah, and even and planning consultants. Yeah. Now, right. Loads of people write off planning consultants, but they're often approached 
at quite an early stage mm-hmm. by a client who says, I don't know what architect to pick. Do you know any architects who are really good at game planning in, in Ealing? And they go, well, yeah, this, these people come up again and again and again, and they do really well. You've basically got the job before you've shown your portfolio <laughs> because what they really want is someone who gets planning permission and that might, and that's probably the reason that you're getting that is probably you're a practice that does loads of research. You deliver really high quality designs that the planners like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's not saying you're not a good practice because you're being recommended, but in, as, you, as Luke says, you should need to be communicating to those audiences as well. Yeah. And again, I think, again, I think sort of coming back to link, ad, advertising LinkedIn here, but again, <laughs> yeah. all of those, all of the built environment is there yeah. and they're not all on Instagram and they're not all on TikTok. And there's certainly a lot of them yes. are terrified of Twitter. Not on TikTok yet. <laughs> the next generation of them will be on TikTok. Um, but I, no, I, I, I think, you know, there's no one really in the chain that you should write off. Got it. So, so we've, we've got kind of direct approaches to potential clients, strategic alliances with both other consultants, mm-hmm. other parts of the construction team, and also other architects. And we've just covered as well you know, you, you kind of highlighted the difficulties of um, traditional media and the accessibility that that's going for. So kind of helping uh, curating journalists' uh, approaches. What about the current resurgence, if you like, I don't know if it's a resurgence or the new, the, the new platforms that have just suddenly boomed in the last yeah. eight months, people putting on, doing their own podcasts and YouTube channels and, you know, there's been a, an enormous amount of, this happening is that worthwhile approaches that for architects to get engaged in do you yeah. think do you think them starting up those sorts of channels is good yeah i mean um the main thing you have to think about when you're deciding what platforms you want to take part in is your audience mm. and just thinking about who uses a particular platform so um, rob just mentioned tiktok for example if you're a practice that is wanting to do um, or encourage a younger audience to, um, you know, know of your work or collaborate in some way, then it might be a good idea to kind of invest some time into thinking about generating content for for that. Um, if you're looking for, I don't know, uh, residential projects, um, extension, residential extensions, then Instagram might be a good place to put a lot of your work there because people use it as a platform to research and, and get kind of inspiration for their for mm. their own projects in a similar way that they would with Pinterest. So it's just thinking about where the audience um, and your client audience would sit and where best to focus your time on it. I don't think it's a good idea to, you know, as soon as another platform comes, go, oh, quick, we've got to jump on that. Um, because you just end up spreading yourself way too thin and most practices will not have the capacity to keep yeah. them keep them um, going and generate content for them. I've, no- I've noticed that YouTube is littered with architecture channels mm. that had about two or three videos uploaded four or five years ago and then nothing since. So I think it's clearly that video is, you know, video is tough and that's why I guess that's why TikTok is so good. It's um, uh, low low commitment in terms of money and resource. Mm. And YouTube, if you want, if, if you want it to look good, it's quite an investment. Yeah, you know. So, although, but then obviously, well, attitudes to that are changing. Well, well it's, it's interesting. Something like something like YouTube nowadays, it needs to be pretty high quality, polished, produced content in order for the algorithm to pick it up and and share it gone are the days where you can get away with doing stuff on your on your phones (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah no i i I mean i think if you're a middle-aged man the urge to do a podcast is incredibly strong and (laughs) i think you just you just need to or an older millennial or an older millennial (laughs) and i think you um you just need you just need to um to think about why you're doing it and so if you have, you know, a bit like this, if you have a genuine interest in, an, in, a, in a sort of way of looking at the industry, um, then you're likely to receive a good audience. Mm. But if, if you're just saying, I've, I've seen lots of people doing podcasts, I don't really listen to them myself, but I think we should have a practice podcast. I think 
it's it's not a good starting point. Yeah, yeah, and that's interesting, and it kind of goes back to some of the fundamentals that need to be in place with a lot of this as well. Like, like, what's your vision? What, where are you going? Who's your audience? Who are the people that you want to be connected with? And kind of like on a deeper level as well, like, what are you standing for? Mm-hmm. Like, what's your sort of your your mission? Because a lot of these things, if they become tactics in order to get something then sometimes they can fall flat or the, the mileage doesn't go there but if it's something that you're genuinely kind of committed to and making a change and, and driving for in your in your business then they become just tools for that kind of expression which has got a lot a lot longer lasting life if you like yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think what can you offer yeah so I mean I came across a small practice of the day obviously work in um, private resi and they were they were every post was like demystifying the process how does this work how does that work what does a drawing look like what does this mean in a drawing like and it was kind of like not beautiful it was like a not very beautiful instagram but just packed with dense information that people really want and they had 30,000 followers and they're not a well-known they're not a well-known practice, mm. but obviously it's the kind of stuff that other people are going to share and be like, oh, I know you were looking into doing this house extension. Have you seen this? And, uh, you know, and then once you've got the follower, they might sort of just, even if they've done their home project, they might just keep following you out of interest. Mm. But I just, I think it just goes to show that you don't need a big name, but, you know, if it's just a promote, if it's just a tool to say, hey, look, I produce lots of beautiful renders, that's not that's not necessarily going to be of interest to a, to a wider audience. It, sometimes it's fine, mm. but you know I think you you've got to think about what are you giving away and and not necessarily be worried that that is going to in some way diminish you. Yeah. So to, to kind of wrap up, if there was one thing or the first thing that practices listening to this should kind of do this afternoon, if you like. What would be what would be your advice? Mm-hmm. You, do you want to go first? Well, I'd, 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 <laughs> I'd say I'd say put two hours aside with you and another colleague. It doesn't have to be everyone, and just say what's going on with our website, brochures, social mm-hmm. media. You know who are we? Who are they for? And just and maybe create just a basic kind of matrix Excel spreadsheet that says this needs to be done, that should be better. Do we need outside help? Can we do it ourselves? You know, like a to, a comms to do list, I guess, mm. because um, it doesn't take long to self analyze, self analyze, and see. And, and people are aware now. You don't need. I mean, it helps to have advice from people like us, but. People are aware that their website is terrible um, and they just think, and just by going through each page, you're like, that but that practice profile isn't what we do anymore. For instance, like it's all about private resi, but we didn't, we've moved on now to other kinds of projects or, oh my God, the most four recent projects are not up there. Mm. Do you know what I mean? And you just, it's just, I think you just need to spend some, just a little, first of all, just a little bit of time about assessing the problem. And then you can you can come up with some solutions. Yeah, I think actually my advice is tied quite closely to that in that you need to, as well as think about your comms plan, think about your business plan. And the business plan and comms plan are tied very closely together. I think I've spoken to quite a few practices who see them as very separate things but that they're not and that is not how you should run um, communications for a practice um otherwise you end up you know kind of having quite a scattergun approach or, or saying like i know we need to do something with instagram but without an idea of like a clear direction and goals for practice it becomes very hard to do that in mm. a kind of genuine uh, successful way that will um, give returns for your business um, so you could do that you know think about your business plan and then move on to some assessment and idea on direction and audience that's well, probably what, what is that maybe it's a half day a half, half day, day. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, what, that's really interesting what is that relationship between your marketing plan and your business plan um so i think it just it just mainly 
from my perspective anyway, when I'm speaking to a practice I've come from outside and I'm trying to get an understanding of what, where the, what the direction of their um, practice is, um, what their goals are, what kind of work they would like to be doing in five, ten years' time. And then you kind of can match that against where they should be focusing their mm. attention in communications. Um, another thing that I do is I will create like a project timeline river practice. So I'll sit down and say, let's go through every single project that you have coming up this year. Um, when is it being submitted for planning? When is it going to receive planning? When is it going on site? When is it completing? Then you map out the entire year um, and you can use that to kind of plan out certain areas of when you want to, you know, enter a project into a ward, for example. You can sit, look at look at a calendar at a glance and say, this is going to finish in March. What awards are coming around March that we could enter this into? Doing that kind of planning in mm. advance really helps you plot out um, your communications for the year ahead. Brilliant. I think that's a, a good place to conclude mm. the conversation there. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.